I'd never been to New Orleans before, and I was surprised at the fact that I completely fell in love with it and, you know, want to move there. And there's something about that city that is just uh, glorious. I mean, if you're going to be on location somewhere that's pretending not to be itself, it's great to be in a city that has a wonderful culture and spirit. It's a great town because it's such a film town now because there's so many movies that shoot there. So you actually want to work hard to make sure that you have a distinctive look. and found, you know, a combination of incredible sets that Neil built on our stages, that many of which were out at the NASA site, and then practical locations in and around town. Especially 1980s downtown Los Angeles, downtown New Orleans is kind of stuck in another time period, so it actually looks more like downtown LA than downtown LA does today. So that worked really well. There wasn't a ton of location work. There was a lot of outdoor work, but it was more like parking lots. We shot the, the Future War uh, very early in the shooting schedule, and we, we went right into six weeks of nights, and that was a big part of it. And we shot in this giant part of the Port of Orleans, and the set was about a quarter mile long. So we had an enormous moon box suspended by a crane enormous set pieces that Neil designed the sections of the wall of the uh, future war camp. There were glimpses of the future war in Cameron's first two movies, and he was a, such an efficient storyteller that he did very little there. He also, I think, wasn't trying to spend money where he didn't have to spend money. I was excited that we got to develop some of the things he already created. There's, you know, wonderful weapons like the Hunter Killers and the Spider Tanks that are all very cool, and we got to do our versions of those. We got to actually spend time, you know, with some gritty, you know, full-on, full production of what it would be like to be in that kind of battle. There was so much pyro and atmosphere uh, and extras and, uh, you yeah, know, endoskeletons. We uh, flipped the goer truck in that scenario. Uh, that was actually the second unit that actually flipped the truck. It was a big handoff between the first unit and the second unit, but all the things with the actors leading into and coming out of each stunt or event was shot by the first unit. It was a real close collaboration between the art department and the lighting department and everybody else, you know, stunts, effects, pyro, actors, <laughs> directors basically D-Day and you see literally the resistance throw everything that they've got at Skynet and it is a massive battle and it is the biggest future war sequence that has been in a Terminator movie to date. The Griffith Park sequence was, you know, tremendously involved in recreating actual Griffith Park in New Orleans in a parking lot. It's surreal to see it all put together. With Arnold, I think there was a turning point for everybody. I, you know, for me, I, I knew he had to be in the movie, but I never met him. And I remember having breakfast with him the first time and having no idea what kind of person I was going to be meeting. You know, he's a movie star forever. He's an action star forever. He was governor. I have no idea what, he, what kind of human being that's going to lead to. And it, the first line I crossed was realizing that he's wonderful to be around. He's open and sensible and funny. And, you know, not just my first breakfast with him, but then with the crew, seeing him laugh. And he always eats lunch with the crew. He's completely unpretentious uh, that way. One of my favorite moments was when we were shooting the Griffith Park Observatory the very first night. And it's Arnold's reveal in the movie, where he pulls his hoodie back and he says, I've been waiting for you. Ready and answer. I've been waiting. And you actually got to look around at the entire crew. The age range is early 20s to 60 and everybody's just grinning ear to ear because the Terminator is on set. See? And action! I've been waiting for you. It's the thing he was born to do, and he's phenomenal at it. And it was like all of a sudden you were stepping back in time and remembering where you were, both for T1 and T2, every time Arnold walked on screen. I've been waiting for you. In this movie, you see this same scene as the 1984 scene, except the scene will unfold in a different way. Except now, 
because of the visual effects that you can do and because of the technology that's available, you can tell that story even better. What was really challenging about it is the Guardian in 1984 is, you know, 20 plus years younger than Arnold himself. We actually scoured the earth to find basically a bodybuilder by the name of Brett. He was the only person who had that 50 inch back that Arnold actually had, but his biceps and, and quads, everything else was slightly lesser then. And then obviously that served as really our proxy. So when you shoot the fight sequence, Arnold and, and you know, basically and everyone has something to interact with. It's wonderful, you know, to me it reminds me sort of of the encounter between the T-1000 and Arnold in T-2 where they first face each other and the, there's something just fun about watching these two things that have the massive Mack trucks going at each other. So it's a human scale fight with punches being thrown but each one is, you know, like a pile driver. Action. The fight tilts in one direction because, let's face it, our Guardian's been around a little longer and he's starting to show some wear and tear. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, this was a meeting between two perfectly matched titans. This was exciting. One of the things we said as we were developing the script is we'd love for people to think up until they get to the moment that Kyle Reese returns to 1984, oh my God, are they really just remaking the first movie but with a bigger future war sequence? Why would they do that? And the reality is we're not. But we are pretty meticulously are recreating that initial 1984 sequence. Again, it's not a shot for shot remake, but there's definitely a lot of homage. Three, two, one, go! Come with me if you want to live! Sometimes we felt like, oh God, we have to shoot this way because look, that's how it was done before. Um, we had to find the right balance of how much we were recreating them exactly and how much we were sort of doing our versions of them. Um, but it was fun to do that and it's been fun to watch audiences respond to them, especially, you know, the fans that really get them. And occasionally we go shot by shot, you know, to the original movie and feeling the fans react to that has been really fun. Because, you know, the broader audience may not understand exactly what the reference is, but the fans, there's a wonderful sort of laugh you know, that you feel in the audience. Set and action! Three, two, one, go! Come with me if you want to live. Now, soldier. <laughs> and we cut. 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 The power plant was a big set piece, which was actually a real, you know, location, an abandoned power plant. We scouted a bunch of different actual locations here in New Orleans, and that particular building has so much richness and character and age. Just a great sort of old abandoned feeling to it. It also needed to be able to hold the armor truck, uh, be big enough for an interesting fight. How do you even describe that building? Uh, <laughs> it sort of has a roof. Y yes, it was uh, basically, it was an abandoned power station and it was kind of falling apart, and we actually, we actually had a horrible day where we got rained out, and there was literally a monsoon that came in, and we were like, well, we're inside, we're gonna be fine, yeah. and uh, there were holes in the roof, no. and so the whole thing- It was about three feet of water. Yeah, and then after that, we're like, well, great, we'll go to the cover set, but all the trucks had sunk into the mud at the power station, so literally me and Dana were sitting in our trailers about 3 a.m., so we were finally like, this is not going is to not stop. Happening. We are not going to shoot today. And, and for the record, it was, um, forecast for scattered showers. Yes. Getting Byung Hun Lee to play the T-1000 was fantastic. He took it so seriously. He was so focused on getting the choreography right for this character. He was sort of correcting me occasionally when I would suggest something and he would say, I don't think he would do that because he'd really thought about it. And I think he's achieved some of the things that Robert Patrick achieved in the you know, T-2, which sort of set the bar for this kind of creature. He's physically beautiful, he's graceful, he's elegant, but he's lethal and scary. Sounds fit. Hey, Mark. I watched T2 again. Actually, I watched it a lot. <laughs> and it was still so fun. And uh, I try to um, be like him. Zero, go. Action-wise, it was so different, because I've never act not as a human, it's a machine. 
I couldn't blink. I couldn't breathe. Uh, action. He was just such a perfect fit. He was like, performed just like a machine. Uh, is, he, is he really a machine? Or what, what's going on here? Because he was so good and so precise. He would do 10 takes and he would hit not a millimeter away from the mark every single time. I talked to him at one point and he told me that he believes like I do in reps because he comes from the athletic background and so it's all about reps, you know, doing it over and over in order to be, be precise. As soon as I got here, production introduced me the movement coach. I thought I was going to meet, you know, some uh, action coordinator or a stunt guy, but Nito, he's basically a dancer. So I was a little surprised by that, but he was really good uh, for my movements, and he helped me a lot. Neil built enormous set pieces. The tunnels and the interior was all beautiful sets built by Neil and conceived by Neil as if there were tunnels underneath this power plant. So he's set a trap. Had to. Can't leave any future tech behind when we go. Go? Go where? The TDD. That is in 1984. And I wanted it to feel like, you know, that we would believe we were underneath that building. I think that the board form concrete is really a beautiful job. The scenic work in here is really nice, feels great, feels dank, feels you know, underground. I think the electromagnets are pretty, pretty great on this. The copper tubing and the sort of mismatched sizes of it and, you know, how it feels organized in a disorganized kind of way. I think that's what we were trying to do with The Guardian. All of the computer equipment is early 80s Apple and um, computers. Well, one of the rules of time travel is that you have to be in a cold room. They're really refrigeration units, and um, we got them from a bunch of various junkyards, and there they are. Some are radiators, actually. We can't be worrying anything? Yeah, I know how time travel works. Sarah, the number of arms and how they work, the number of rings and how they spin, the way that a person is lifted into the time machine, the idea that the room is cold, it applies to the other sets. So the frosted quality of the edges of things and you know the idea that we were refrigerating the space. In regards to really being a, a film-friendly town in New Orleans, something we could never do anywhere but New Orleans is the freeway arrival sequence. Yeah. We literally kind of had this dream of, well, let's shut down the largest overpass in New Orleans and shoot on it for three nights. You know, you couldn't do that in New York or San Francisco, and New Orleans was like, absolutely. We'll shut the whole thing down for you. It'll be fine. You can bring your crews on there. And we kind of looked at each other and we're like, they're really, really? going to let us do this? this? Three this, days. Is, this okay. is great. And so, uh, so again, that sequence has that scale to it because New Orleans allowed us to, you know, you know, shoot that sequence there that literally no place else in the world would let us do it. All right, let's go. I'll get us out of here. Stay close. Wait. We all know they can shapeshift. If you are John, prove it. Sarah. No, 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 no. She's right, Kyle. She is. Jason Clark playing John Connor is an incredibly dynamic actor, and and that's what this this particular version of of John Connor really requires. Jason is just so intense in his portrayal of John that it's much less about gunfire than it is about the physicality of what he created because it's not quite human. So, and it's sort of the power of charisma. And you see that yeah. in the beginning, the charismatic leader who, who you know, what, what happens if you take a messiah and you push him, Corrupt. you know, you let him fall from grace in a way that uh, inflicts him to be on the other side. What is that point of view? Ready. And 
Well, I always look at a character from, you know, what he's doing is right in his own mind. And, and you know, I think John, John's agenda and his decision about what's happened to him is, is very justified, you know, in terms of he believes that the only way to break this cycle is, is to not just side with the machine, but become part of the machine. Let him go. Right now. <coughs> <laughs> he truly believes that this is the way ahead and he would like to take Sarah and Kyle with him, you know? But we all have to make our own choices. You're not machine. You're not man. I'm more. What do you want from us? I'm offering us a future together. As a family. No more widows and orphans. What I love about Jason's performance is he didn't really go from being the all good guy to the all bad guy. He sort of kept a continuity there, where even as the villain, he still thinks he's doing the right thing. So John Connor dramatically goes from being our greatest hope to being our greatest threat. Inverting him so that he becomes the biggest threat is just dramatically fun. And it also feels like it's within Cameron's mythology because one of the most brilliant things he did was that big inversion of taking the villain from the first film and making him the hero of the second film. We've had a lot of fun as a, as, a, as a little troop. Jason, it's funny, I mean, the demands of this shoot schedule have, uh, have led to a situation where two Aussie guys in the same cast haven't even had a beer together yet, which uh, I'm pretty embarrassed about, to be honest. But it's the truth, and I think that's just testament to how hard everyone's been working. It's been nuts, but uh, it had to be in order to, you know, get this thing done and done right. There are things that New Orleans could really deliver for us. And the, the one place we went on location to actually nail it was um, San Francisco, because our film ends there. And we had to get some of the, um, the iconography that you only get there to go to the Golden Gate and go to the bunkers up in the hills above the Golden Gate. Oh, I love it. It's, it's the way to do it. It's, I mean, everyone, it becomes realer for everybody and, you know, one less degree of pretend. San Francisco has such a unique look and a unique quality of light. One, drop. And it was so helpful to actually be able to capture some of that. Gives scope and scale so that really ties in what we did in New Orleans. Yeah, how much would it cost to shift all the buses and motors there on that? To that end? Because we were shooting in New Orleans in the summer. By the time we left, it was a little warm, to say the least. <laughs> And then we take our entire crew to San Francisco and we're all wearing sweaters and jackets because we're freezing. Bang! Fog and trying to shoot on the bridge. We really <laughs> wanted beautiful, pristine shots of the Golden Gate Bridge and we got a lot of standing around, looking at clouds, going, wait, wait, it's moving, turn the cameras on. Yeah. We actually went back up there later to get the crystal clear shots. To get the shots. beautiful, beautiful shots yeah. that you see in the movie. But hey, it's real and it gives atmosphere to the film. Yeah. Yeah. Alan Taylor is, is um, oh, he's just so good. <laughs> he's just so good. Uh, Alan is, uh, I don't understand <laughs> how anybody, you know, can keep all these balls in the air and have a clue about what's going on. And his, you know, his sense of the big picture is so complete and so thorough. Hang on! He's a very smart man and he knows story and he knows actors and he comes from some of the greatest TV ever done, The Sopranos and, and then on Game of Thrones and Mad Men. You know, it's been a pleasure to work with, like really. The great thing about Alan Taylor is he doesn't get intimidated. A lot of times when I have a director, new director in the film, you know, they don't know how far should they go with correcting me? Or what should they say and how should they say it? And a lot of times directors would then go to my team or to my assistant or to someone and says, can you tell him, 
you know, to tone it down a little bit or to bring it up a little bit, but not Alan Taylor, because he and I, we talked about it beforehand, and we said, look, if there's a scene that you don't like, then just tell me this doesn't work. Um, ideally, on action, you start to walk. This time, it felt like you hesitated, and you sort of came in fast. Oh, I so see. I think coming not so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just basically you're, you're walking forward. Yeah, yeah, forward. exactly. Okay, okay good. I'll start wherever you need to go. Yeah. From day one on, he was never intimidated, and he came right to me, and he always very gentleman-like, may I remind you. He would get the point across very clear that we can do better than that. And then he put more energy in it, and he really is there to pump you up. It's a little bit almost like a shrink, you know, that comes in this. And I remember that here we, we did, yesterday we did this. Today we're doing it in a different way. And just think about when you do this scene in Conan, and then you crush the enemy. You know, just give me that drive. filming at NASA, where you need about a zillion passes to get in. The sets are as big as the moon. What about that? Is it dangerous? Poly Alloy requires programming to take permanent form. Without the CPU, it is harmless. The whole concept of world building and visual design was very much a close collaboration between myself and Neil, the production designer. There's a lot of discussion about how we would incorporate lighting into his sets, because there's so much technology and light. Matt Smith plays the, the T-5000, which is something that we've never seen, which is very much the personification of Skynet walking the Earth. So for me, What's been exciting about this challenge is that it's the idea and the notion that I get to play someone that's a bad guy. And that's something that, that I've been really interested in. And, and, you know, we hope as the T-5000 develops that he's going to be, you know, pure supervillain. Why can't you just accept it? Because we're human. The final battle sequence in the third act is epic. Good versus evil, and technology versus man, and a huge amount was shot by the second unit. People often ask me when I work on a movie like this, oh, was it all blue screen? Was it just, you know? Action. And it's not all blue screen. I mean, there's, you know, a huge amount of blue screen that we do, but there's also a tremendous amount of in-camera photography. Action. Bang! Well, if you're going to throw it down with anyone on the screen, you want it to be Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I love that. I mean, he's a lot of fun, you know. Close up, Close up of him again. Of me again. And he's still in shape. I mean, he's just, he's a strong dude. And he knows what he's doing. I mean, he's got so much experience with fights and on film. One, action! Well, you only get to do this kind of action on a big budget film. <laughs> I mean, lots of, you know, suspension, ropes, pulleys and all that, but not just in a base. I mean, some of them have been very complicated setups and ups and moves and, you know, just use them just for a big, wild swing, but just a little bit here and pull there. And action! It's just that great thing of, of trying to, um, you know, so that each adds to the other, that it becomes, but still based in a reality, in a, you know, in a world that we've created that exists and we stick to the rules. And Arnold, really talked a lot about the fighting and how Terminators fight and how, you know, that him and him and Jim, you know, particularly in the first and the ones that they did together, it was a real big thing about the style of, of, of the way it operates. And, um, and, you know, I know we've all worked very hard to try and, you know, be true to that and also keep that imagination and that, that thread going. When you see the final product, no matter how much you've thought about what it's going to look like in the end, it's always you know a jaw dropper to see a set that's been fully extended and executed, and all the different CG elements that are in there. You're just like, wow. 
It's some of the, the most enjoyable action I've ever done. You know, it's, it's creative and it's fun. Coming down off the ledge, jumping up and down on a big pile drive. So it's just been, it's been cool, you know?